All right, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here uh, today. Uh, my name is Mike Ramos, District Attorney of San Bernardino County, and I introduce myself because I have uh, with me my executive staff. Um, Bob Bullock, who I'll talk about in a little bit, supervising DDA, who was assigned this case, to trial lawyer, Mary Ashley, my assistant to DA, who was assigned this uh, to oversee the entire project, uh, my chief investigator, Mike Smith, uh, my chief assistant DA, Michael Furman, and my other assistant over criminal operations, Gary Roth. Um, we took this matter to the highest level in the district attorney's office, as you can see by the people that were handling this case for many reasons that I will discuss here shortly. This morning, we filed three charges, three counts of assault by a public officer in violation of Penal Code Section 149, a felony. It was committed by Deputy Nick Downey, Michael Phelps, and Charles Foster, who assaulted and beat Francis Jared Cusack under the color of authority, the, the, the defendant being then and there a public officer to wit, a peace officer. Basically, the elements of Penal Code Section 149, the peace officer was involved. He was acting under the color of authority. The assault would beat another individual with legal, without, excuse me, without legal necessity, using more force than was necessary under the circumstances. The law says the factors you consider are the following. The severity of the crime at issue. Whether the suspect possessed an immediate threat to the officers or others. Whether at the time the suspect was resisting or attempting to evade arrest at the time or any other exigent circumstances. This is a very, very thorough investigation. The evidence considered by us was hundreds of pages of discovery provided by the sheriff's investigative team. Belt recordings by those officers that were involved. The news video that was provided by NBC News. We broke that down, or my staff did, frame by frame. Interviews that were conducted. Visiting the crime scene, both my assistant and the supervising DA that's handling the case went up with the sheriff's helicopter team and went to the actual location and the terrain of where this actually occurred. We looked at all the events prior to the news video and after the news video. And I need to say this out loud. There was a lot more than just that five minute piece. And then finally we applied the laws and the facts to the law that was applicable in this matter. We put up some photos here and I will br just briefly talk about them just so you can see in the first photo, number one, you see one of the deputies charged, Nick Downey, who, when Usak is down with his face down and his hands behind his back, on photos one, two, you can see in these, these time frames that we, we pulled from the video where he has kicked him once and twice while he was already in this position. Photo number three, Michael Phelps. You can see him hurrying back his leg ready to kick. And you can also, again, I believe, see the position of Mr. Prusak with his hands behind his back, his head on the ground, in his prone position as he is kicking him in the groin area. And then finally, photo number four that was taken, as you can see, almost four and a half minutes after the first photo. In this circumstance here, you have Husak, who has been hobbled by the individual in photograph four, who at this time, after he's been handcuffed, his legs are bound, turned on his side, that the deputy in this picture, and you can't see it clearly, but in the video, if you look at the video in the small pieces, the deputy rears back and kicks him for almost five minutes after. And that would have been Deputy Charles Foster. 
Would you mind summarizing all of that you did now on the microphones? Sure. So that we have all of that? Absolutely. Photos number one and two show Deputy Nick Downey kicking Mr. Pusak in the head area. As you can see in that photo, he is prone, he is down, his hands are behind his back. Photo number three, Deputy Mike Phelps, as you can see, Pusak continues to be on the ground with his hand behind his back uh, and proceeds to kick him in the groin area. And photo number four, you can see Deputy Charles Foster, after he's been hobbled, Pusak, turned on his side, proceeds to kick him after he's been hobbled and handcuffed and on his side. What you don't see in the photographs, and you can see on the, the video, and you've seen them, is the other physical contacts and blows that are committed by these, at least the first two, I'm gonna make this clear, the first two deputies, um, whether it's by, uh, by hands, fists, um, but you can see that in the video. Now, it's very important now that I distinguish why the other seven were not charged. And the law is very clear. A peace officer may presume that a fellow officer has acted lawfully. If one of several deputies acted unlawfully or engaged in an unreasonable excessive force, that officer's actions those officers' actions are not imputed to another officer unless that officer knew or should have knew, known that the fellow officers were acting unlawfully. We carefully took a look at every individual in this case. And we looked at the facts. We looked at the terrain, I told you. And the, 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 it's really important, as you can see the terrain, those bushes are tall. You can't see around them. So when these other officers are running up, what they hear on the belt recording, and I'm not going to get into the details, I'm going to leave that for court. They hear something the other officers are yelling, not knowing the circumstances they can't see when they come upon Mr. Pusak and the other officers there. And in fact, one of the reasons I have Chief Smith here, we talked to Chief Smith and my investigators, the use of force that they showed was reasonable under the circumstances. A lot of those officers just put their foot on him, to hold him down to make sure he wasn't moving. So we took all those factors into consideration on why we did not charge the others. Finally, I want to thank the sheriff's team and their investigators. They did an outstanding professional job. They looked at everything. They didn't hold anything back and they worked with both my assistant, uh, Ashley, and Bob Bullock almost daily at first to make sure that everything was covered, did not hide a thing, and I really respect that. I want to thank my DA team that's standing with me, all of us, Matt, with, regarding this case. Finally, the district attorney's role, the foundation of our justice system, is in the fabric of ethics and integrity. We must be held. I must be held to the highest standard. We are an independent seeker of the truth and justice. Independent. Independent. Today we followed our oath, both the oath under the Constitution of the State of California and the United States of America, in reaching our decision. But I have to tell you this. Law enforcement is one of the most honorable professions in the world. The men and women in law enforcement risk their lives every day. It's horrible what I read about what happened in Chicago today and just what happened the other day. Law enforcement officers are losing their lives just because they wear a uniform. Our Sheriff's Department continues to be one of the best in the United States of America, solving cases, and we work with them on a daily basis, and all of their deputies. I believe the deputies that were filed on today crossed the line under color of authority. But their actions should not tarnish the badge of those that honorably serve every day, every day in the county of San Bernardino and the United States of America. I want to thank you for the time, for being here this morning, and at this time, uh, I also 
we'll open it up to any questions. And I, I will also thank the, the sheriff for being here and his staff. Cassie. Um, Mike, I, I know this must have been a very difficult decision for you. And while I understand the reasons for the three being charged, yes. and I understand what you said about the others who came up on the scene yes. while this was going on, there's one that seemed a little bit egregious to me, and that was an officer who came in, you know, well into the meeting, who was dressed differently. He seemed like he was wearing a blue dress shirt with a, a vest over it on the right. outside, and administered what seemed to me a gratuitous kick. Why was that person not charged? You know, we looked at that, Cassie, and uh, I won't go into details, but you know, I have a lot of respect for you, and. and what your reporters are here to report about. So I will say this, when we coordinated the belt recordings and the recordings of what was going on and what actually was taking place, it made uh, it very clear to us that those that crossed the line and some of those deputies that were responding were hearing things on the belt recording that weren't really occurring. And so they still felt that he was a threat. And that was one of those situations. I can't really explain in more detail than that because I want I want to make sure that happens in the court of law. So the belt recording goes out live over the radio. Yes. Yes. The uh, yes. the last deputy yeah. to go in is that the the, the deputy that uh, you're talking about? Because it seemed like it was pretty much all over, and the, the last deputy comes in and kind of nudges his way in, and then. <coughs> No, that's, a different, one or two. that's a different one I think that Cassie's okay. talking about. The last deputy we charged, Charles Foster, comes in and hobbles him near the, the you know, his legs, and then as they roll him sideways, as then photo number four is when he kicks him. So you're, but he wasn't the last one to come in? No. Okay. No, he wasn't the last one to come in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, obviously, the video is, it speaks yes. volumes. Right. But outside of the video, what carried the most weight in your making the decision that you made? I think outside of the video, uh, okay. the video of course was, was a tremendous help, but I think outside of the video was twofold. One is taking all of the ed evidence in totality and, and comparing it to what you saw in the video, but especially um, the, the audio of the belt recordings. It really helped us make our decision to distinguish who violated the law and who did not. And follow up on that, are you saying that, uh, given that you're saying that the seven other deputies were hearing things that were not happening, Correct. is it your belief that the three deputies that you are charging or, or looking at charges with uh, intentionally said things to mislead the other de deputies who are coming up on the scene? That's something I'm going to leave to the court of law, but if that is something that we took into consideration. Did you say it that way? Did your uh, uh, investigation include interviews with all the deputies, or did uh, they not participate? Our investigation continued some some interviews, right? Some interviews. Did you interview uh, these three? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, these three, two of the three were interviewed. And can you share anything about what their version of events was? No, I, you know, I've got to really protect their rights. I mean, it's uh, well, I'm I mean, sure that this this is fair, but uh, they were interviewed, and they did have attorneys at the time when they were interviewed. And did they say? Anything you can't share with us, even in general terms, that they uh, felt justified, they felt threatened, what? I, I can't really comment on that at this time. I need to protect their, their rights. Well, I mean, you're already right. talking about them publicly. We're sure. trying try to get some insight into what they might have been yeah. thinking or saying they were thinking at the time. Yeah, um, again, I, I don't want to go into that because that's going to be probably a motion prior to, to trial. Mr. Yes. Ramos, uh, you know, if they are convicted, what are they looking at as far as punishment goes? Sure, the, the range is 16, 2, and 3, uh, 3 years. And that's uh, under AB 109, local state prison. And, and what's the PC again on this? Uh, PC 149. Excuse, Excuse me, me, local county prison. Mm -hmm. Excuse my ignorance. 16, 2, and 3. Me, 16 me. months is the uh, mitigated term. The middle term is, is two years. Three years would be the aggravated term. Uh, but it could be anything. You know, uh, it could be uh, local time and, and a felony conviction and felony probation to, to the max. And then, uh, the other thing, the follow-up I had, really, the follow -up I had, did you have any input from the public at all? Was there any kind of a sense of outrage from the public over this? It was widely seen. 
by so many people, but I don't know, did your office ever get any input from the public? I don't want to, I'm not sure if my office got any input from the public. I'm sure on our face page or whatever, Facebook, you know, what, a website we probably did. I didn't look at that. I didn't take that into consideration. I'm not necessarily no, saying no. that. I'm just right. wanting to know if right. if people called and said, I demand something happen to these people, right. did you have any kind of... No. No? no did you actually interview uh, Francis Cusack himself about what would have happened? Um, did we? No, we did not. We did not. Yes, sir. How difficult would it have been for you to file these charges if you didn't have the aerial video? <coughs> would the belt cams have told the same story? No. Yes. What was the status of the three charge deputies, their employment status with the Sheriff's Department? Um, that's something I know they're at the, the Sheriff, would you kind of come on up? Before I get started and answer your question, Joe, um, let me just say that we work very hard to build and maintain the trust of the public. Events like today undermine the great work that the men and women of this organization and law enforcement across the country do every single day. A few months ago, I promised that we would do a complete and thorough investigation, hand that over to the district attorney's office to make a determination independently as to whether or not charges should be filed. I respect the process and I respect the independent decision that our district attorney's office made. To your question, Joe, the 10 deputies are still on administrative leave, including those three that were charged today. What's the status of the administrative investigation? <laughs> it's still ongoing. We're getting much closer to it. Several parts of the administrative investigation cannot be completed until after the criminal case has been completed. We always do that first, as you saw. We provided the investigation to the DA's office on July 1st. The administrative investigation continues, and a determination will be made with any luck at all soon. Sheriff, are they still getting paid? Yes, sir. Can you share how much experience these three that were charged have, Sheriff? I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I can certainly provide them at some point in the future. So if, how, I'm, not how do you if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we initially gave the names, I think there was their length of service with the department, I think was included in that. But if it wasn't, we can provide that. So the belt recorders you're talking about, are those uh, mandatory equipment, required equipment, or is that up to each deputy? Every deputy sheriff has issued a belt recorder and they wear it. They're encouraged to turn it on when they have some type of a contact, and in this particular case, a number of them had their belt recordings going during this incident. And what, what is the, I know the answer to this, I think, but there's a lot of discussion about video cameras. Mm -hmm. And so what is the value of the belt recorders, how, how, and how long have you used them? Belt recorders have been in place for a number of years. And if you remember back in the history, we looked at body cameras several years ago. And at that point, we were not comfortable with the technology, the equipment that was being used, so we made a decision to equip each deputy sheriff with a digital audio recorder. As we move forward and the technology gets better, we're again testing new body cameras. We have three vendors that we've been working with and we'll roll out the test at the two stations I described several months ago, one in the desert and one in the valley. We'll analyze the results that type of equipment, and then make a decision to roll it out permanently. And when, when does that test start? As soon as we get through the RFP process and select the vendor. Sheriff, do you have any thoughts on how this could happen in this day and age with a helicopter right above them? Well, I think we can talk about the helicopter being above them and that maybe folks should know there's a helicopter above them. Let me remind you that there were three helicopters in addition to the news helicopter overhead at certain times during this entire incident. There was a couple of our helicopters, a highway patrol helicopter, as well as our medium-sized Huey helicopter that brought deputies in to the termination point because of the terrain and the extended distance they had to travel. So there was a lot of helicopter noise. And so for someone to suggest that they should have known a helicopter from the news service was overhead is an unfair assumption. But what we explain to our deputy sheriffs is that regardless of whether there's a camera, 
either on the ground or overhead. We're always doing the right thing. I would love for that to be captured. I'm not sure it would ever get played, but I would love to see it get captured because it shows the great work the men and women, not only in our county do, but across this country. And I think it's important that we don't lose sight of the hundreds of thousands of contacts that occur across this country with law enforcement. And the overwhelming majority of them go very, very well. But oftentimes what we end up seeing are the ones that go bad, and we don't often hear about all the great work that the men and women of law enforcement do each and every day under difficult conditions. <laughs> you know that a number of officers have been killed in the line of duty this week, just this week. Another one this morning. The conditions that the men and women of our organization and others are dealing with today, with realignment and, and violent felons being out on the street that used to be in prison, is taking a significant impact on law enforcement across this country. And you see it every single day. So that sounds like you're making an excuse, which I don't think you are. Absolutely not. I'm not making an excuse for any misconduct. And I'm here today to tell you that we prepared that complete and thorough investigation as I promised. We sent that to the district attorney's office and they made an independent decision. I respect that decision. And I'm the first one to tell you that one of the men and women of our organization do something that's either wrong administratively or policy violation or criminally, we'll take the appropriate action. I heard from some deputies kind of off to the side during this process that, hey, this isn't our style, this is not what we're about. What, what, what did you hear from your deputies? I've heard a lot of that as well. Did, did they encourage you to go any certain way on the, the case? Or same thing for you, Mike, have you heard from any deputies? Uh, you know, no, they did not from my perspective. Charges. I do want to ask Mike. No, you know, I, I will tell you this, that the, what we do in public safety and working with our partners, the sheriff's department, the, the police agencies, the police departments, uh, our deputy district attorneys, um, we all know that the majority of law enforcement officers in this county conduct themselves in a very professional manner. And they, they have, I mean, probably the toughest jobs right now in the nation. Um, and so um, I think that it's really important to, to follow up on that question that when some of those do cross the line that we hold them responsible because we have to really distinguish them from the 99.9% .9 of peace officers that are doing their job, um, that, that are doing it uh, ethically, that are doing it professionally, and should not tarnish what they do every day. And uh, I think that's a big, a big statement to make too as well. Um, and so overall, um, I think you, you'll see we're not in these press conferences. I've been DA for 12 and a half years, and we're not in these press conferences because officers are conducting themselves in a very professional manner. Uh, I'm sorry. Your thoughts on your thoughts on those deputies who chose or did not think in the moment to start their recorders? There's a variety of reasons that they don't turn their recorders on. Um, sometimes things happen so quickly that they don't reach down to turn them on because they're involved in trying to think about what's going to happen next and they're obviously their focus is on the incident at hand. So clearly there were some that had the time or the, the mindset to turn theirs on and some that didn't. And as I stand here today, I can't tell you how many turned it on and how many did not. And in that process, when would they have submitted those audio so I guess the question I'm getting to is if the chopper wasn't overhead, is there a possibility that we may not be sitting here right now? No, I truly believe there would have been use of force investigation and those tapes would be turned over at that point. Now to what degree and what evidence would have been available, obviously without the video it would have been different, but a use of force investigation would have been completed and those audio tapes would have been, or audio uh, clips would have been downloaded and provided. Good time sure. for a few more questions. After that, I have a copy. So of can anybody else up there questions. provide us with the answer of how many of the 10 had their audio recorders on? I can get back to you with that number, but I, I thought you did this thorough investigation already. That would be fairly basic, wouldn't it? 
one sure. more question. Sheriff, did anyone, did anyone no. in, your, in, uh, in the group of deputies out there say stop or this is enough or, you know, I, uh, and you even, you even had a sergeant out there, James Evans, who, who I would, you know, in a supervisory <laughs> role might, might try to put a, a, a stop to this if, if he felt things were out of hand. I am not sure if there was anybody that said stop or I have him or he's handcuffed or any of that. I'm not aware of any specific statements in that regard. That will be determined through the interviews and the administrative process of the investigation, which is under. You know, one more from Mike. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to imagine what everything that's gone on or been going on that this decision could be made in, in, a, in a vacuum as much as you would like to do it. You had the, the backlash from Ferguson and uh, Baltimore and the, uh, the shooting of the guy running away and yeah. back east and mm -hmm. the fact that you're running for attorney general. What, what influences were circling out there, outside influences, as you were trying to make this decision and what, what did you try to do to insulate yourself? Well, never, ever did I consider any political outside influences, uh, whether it had to do with myself or anyone else. Now, will I tell you, this was a easy decision to make when Cassie asked the first question. No, I have so much regard for law enforcement, especially my county sheriff's department. I grew up with it, I tried cases with them. I understand the men and women that put their lives on the line every day. So this is a, this is a decision that needed to be made independent of any other factors. And I can honestly tell you today, none of those factors came into play when we made these the decisions I made the district attorney's office. Just to clarify, you did file this morning, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I have a copy of the complaint, a copy Thank of the press release out of the back room. Thank